So my topic today in this session, please write it down, is the danger of uncontrolled change. The danger of uncontrolled change. You'll understand why this topic is important in a minute. Our focus today is understanding the necessity for unchanging laws. Why is it necessary for there to be some laws that you don't change? Uncontrolled change will destroy. So even though we want change and we desire to see things change, in many instances that change may be destructive. So our focus today is the danger of uncontrolled change. It's a comment about change I want to make first. The most predictable reality on earth is change. If there's one thing you can predict, is change. Secondly, change is inherent in creation. Everything will change. God created everything to experience change naturally. Every plant, every animal, the weather, the seasons, your body, your relationships, everything will change naturally. That leads me to point number four. Make mankind is the only creature in creation who has the power to determine the change. They can design what kind of change they want. That is a dangerous power. Animals function on instinct. Humans don't. Humans have the power to decide what to change. Therefore, the human has what we call the power of will. Will is a curse and a blessing. And it's the greatest gift and the most dangerous gift God ever gave humans was a will. The will is the power to decide. Animals function on natural instinct. We function on intention. Will is intent. Therefore, the result of this is that God has placed the power of the will in the hands of man, and that means that the future of the world is in the hands of mankind. We can decide how the earth looks. This creates some very serious issues. We can decide what nations will look like, what communities will look like, what culture will look like. We can decide what is normal and what is not normal. We can determine what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. All that power is in your hand. We can decide to love God or curse God. We can decide to abandon truth or create our own. This is a powerful power called the will that God gave us. And because of that, change is in our hands. I want to list very quickly what I call human imposed change. We are using the will to impose some changes in the world right now and all nations are experiencing these changes. First, political confusion. Constitutional revisions are taking place all over the world. Social transitions, ideological reinventions, philosophical instability. We also experience moral manipulation of our countries. Values vacillation. Our values are up and down. We're not sure what we value anymore. Religious conflicts. Scientific inventions. We are deciding how to use them. 
technological advancement, and of course, economic interdependence, we call it globalization. That's a massive change that's taking place. The last one I think is very dangerous, redefinition of terms. We are redefining things, even redefining words. Words like marriage, we want to redefine it. So this is the kind of world we live in. And I wanted to quickly take you through what I call the age of change. Man has gone through a number of changes, and I'm going to go through these very quickly. Some of you who are history students would recognize them. Uh, you've heard about the age of the Renaissance. Then we have the age of reason, the age of postmodern era. We have another age we define as the age of secularism. Then we have the scientific age, the age of enlightenment, the age of, of uh, humanistic society. And then we have a recent one that just came along called the age of the new normal, whatever that means. And then we have what I am going to define the age we live in right now, and it's the big one. We live in the age of experimentation. We are experimenting with everything. We are tampering with economic formulas. We are experimenting with relationships. We are experimenting with politics. We are experimenting with education. We are experimenting with all kinds of different cultural entities. We are not sure what we want. This is a dangerous period right now we live in. Experimentation. What's the result of unchecked change? I'm going to give you a reality check real quick. We are witnessing changes in, first of all, the collapse of governments, the rise of people power, international and domestic terrorism, states of countries are failing, global economic crises affect everybody, massive unemployment is everywhere, and of course, we have the default and disgrace of top leaders in every area, whether it's politics or business or priests or bishops or corporate executives, there seem to be no trust in leadership anymore. Then there is a change in the moral compass of our world. Things that we used to consider immoral are now becoming acceptable. Another problem we are seeing is the collapse of sovereignty, where countries are no longer sovereign because they are controlled by entities like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, or the United Nations, are imposing on countries restrictions and criteria and conditions in order for them to participate in the global scheme of things. This means that sovereignty has been basically dissolved. And this is why I say we have a collapse of sovereignty. Now, all of these are changes we're living in. And I want you to really listen to me carefully because... If you're not aware of this, you're going to be swallowed up by this and become a victim of it. Let's take then a quick look at the results of these changes. First, distrust of authority. People don't trust leaders anymore. Then we have liberalism creeping in, lawlessness, permissiveness, compromise, immorality, reengineering of morals. Culture of death taking over the countries, culture of violence, devaluation of human life, generational disillusionment, and sexual and social confusion. These are the results of the changes that we are dealing with in the world. And I want you and I to be intelligent about this. Because we are going to understand how to solve a problem if we can analyze the problem. The Apostle Paul told the people of God, that's you, he said, be not ignorant of Satan's devices. In other words, study your enemy before you attack. Understand what the enemy's equipment is, what his weapons are, and how he fights. This is exactly why Goliath was defeated. Because... He didn't study David's weapon. David understood his weapon. He knew and understood Goliath's equipment. And that's why David killed him. We have to understand 
what's happening in order for us to know what to do. I mentioned to you earlier in this series that the number one tribe of Israel was a little tribe called Issachar. Issachar is a tribe you don't hear much about in the, you know, in the talk when you talk about the tribes of Israel. But God said that they were the most effective one. And it, God told us why. He said because they understood the times and they knew what to do. Just two things. So when you see me talking like this, you need to listen to me carefully. I'm trying to help you understand the times so we can know what we must do. Jesus told the Pharisees and scribes one time when he was teaching them about the kingdom. He made a statement I hope he would never make to me. He said, you do not know the time of your own visitation. In other words, you can miss what God wants to do because you're not aware of what's happening. I hope God will never say that to me. And so this is the world we live in. And here's a statement to write down. The world cannot heal itself from this situation. Albert Einstein said something I repeat it often. He said, you cannot solve a problem at the same level it was created. Jesus said it this way. A bitter tree cannot bring forth sweet fruit. In other words, an unrighteous man cannot become a righteous government leader. You cannot demand sweet water from a bitter spring. Which means that if man created the problems, man cannot solve them. Are you with me? That's why for God to save the world, he couldn't find someone in the world to save it. So for God so loved the world, he didn't use anybody in it to save it. He sent someone from outside into the world. So the sign that Jesus is not from earth is a sign that we cannot save ourselves. That leads me to point number two. Doing nothing is not an option. The world is crumbling, nations are imploding, social structures are collapsing, and the issue is we cannot just watch it happen. Because we are in it. That leaves you to point number three. Write this down. Whatever you allow, you can never criticize. In other words, <laughs> Whatever you avoid, you can never change. And whatever you complain about, you can never criticize. And this is why point number five is important. You must become the answer to your own prayer for change in the world. No longer should you ask God to send someone to fix something. This is the time in life where God is saying, you fix it. You do something about it. You take action because you are responsible for this error. And this is why God is telling us, I want you to transform your society by you taking leadership with kingdom influence. What a heavy burden I feel in my spirit right now. You see, whatever you permit, you are responsible for. So if we sit back and allow them to pass laws that we disagree with, we can never criticize those laws. So don't come back, you know, four years later saying, I disagree. You was quiet. Jesus said, you go to the rooftops and you, you, you shout out the truth. You are not responsible for people's response. But you are responsible for declaration of truth. That will be the point number seven. Write it down. You can let things happen or you can make them happen. And that is where we are at in life right now. You either can let things happen and become a victim of them. Or you can decide I am going to make what happens happens I'm gonna make sure the decisions that are made and the changes we experience I have something to do with them you know God didn't wait for us to ask him to save us 
God initiated the process. For God so loved the world that he what? Sent. He didn't care whether the world loved him or not. I love the world, he says. I am going to be proactive. I am going to act. That is what we are called to do, my friend. We are called to act. We are called to make sure that things don't just happen. Look at this picture on the wall. Don't you love this picture? <laughs> if we want a new society, we're going to have to do some things. I like this picture. That's me. Fishy, fishy, fishy. Read it. The statement at the top. Read. If you want something in your life you've never had, you'll have to do something you've never done. In other words, jump. You got to take a chance. You might miss the bowl, you know. But at least you didn't stay with those who cropped up in a bowl. You cannot change the world by remaining safe. You cannot change the world by being afraid of criticism. It is the man or woman who have decided that criticism is an encouragement that become dangerous people. If you are not afraid of opposition, if you're not afraid of criticism, you are dangerous. So take a chance and leap. And that's what this ministry is doing. We are leaping out of the bowl of the churches and we are going into God's obedient command. Go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. I want you to read this next statement because when you begin to, to, to leave the pack, you may run into some problems with your own friends. Some of you are laughing already. Out loud, read it with me. Please read it with me. Go. I am making some changes in my life. And if you don't hear anything from me, you are one of them. There are some people you got to leave in the old bowl. Give God a hand for change. You, if you're going to make change, you got to change your life, change your relationships, and change your position in order for you to make an impact in the world. I want you to make a statement and write this down, please. Our present age, therefore, is what I call what? The age of experimentation. And that means we are making changes without consideration of the consequences or even the realities of truth. We are experimenting. Recently in America, when the Supreme Court was asked a few weeks ago to deliberate on the issue of same-sex marriage, the Supreme Court justices had to deal with that, and for about a week they were debating it. And one of them said, something interesting, I heard him say this, he said, uh, we should not be delving into things we don't understand yet and then he said for example we don't know the consequences of a child being brought up in a home with two men or two women as husband and wife he said we don't even know the impact psychologically on the child what he's saying is we are experimenting with even children's lives it is a shame to make something a law that you don't even know the results of. And that's why I think it is unfair for people to make demands in society for things to be legalized that they themselves have been studied and they expect you to sanction it as an experiment. That's the age we're living in. An age of experimentation. I look at this sign. This is the way man is. This sign describes man right now, the humans. Look at those signs. Read those words aloud. Lost, confused, unsure, unclear, perplexed, disoriented, bewildered. That's humans. In other words, our problem is found in the book of Deuteronomy 28. Now, I want to tell you this verse. You never saw this verse before because you always quote the other verses. All of you love to quote Deuteronomy 28, 
You shall be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming out, blessed coming in. You'll be blessed in the barn and blessed in your womb. Your enemies shall be scattered seven ways. You love that verse. But the verse ends with this statement. But if you walk away from my laws, the Lord says, I will afflict you with what? Now, he says, I can give you no sickness, you know. I can make you mad. That means you're crazy. You are tricky with what? With madness, blindness, and confusion. God actually sees them worse than cancer. Take a deep breath. He says the greatest curse is not that you got the cold or a headache. He said the greater curse is your head ain't right. Look at the laws we are trying to pass. You know we're going crazy. But notice he says what? I will afflict you with madness. That means people who went to universities and got degrees will act stupid. They will make decisions that don't make any sense. He will make the educated irrational. I will afflict you with what? With the first madness in other words the next time you meet somebody who is suggesting some changes that are not you know wholesome for society just tell them you are mad and you got a legal right to say it now notice what God says if you walk away from my laws in other words anything anyone any proposal any prospect any reformation, any reform that is against the laws of God is a sign of a society that's going mad. Ladies and gentlemen, the next word God uses is what? Blindness. Blindness means that even though you see the truth, you can't see it anymore. Your mind is so set on what you want that you can't even see the truth. You only see what you want to see. That's blindness. I know this is wrong, but it feels good to me and I want it. That's blindness. It's like an alcoholic. You know, they're famous, aren't they? I know it ain't good for me, but I like it. See, that, that, that's, that's madness. I know my daddy died from cigarette cancer, but I like to smoke. This is madness. Blindness. Experimenting. And the last one is what? Confusion. Hey, boy, say confusion. God said, when you walk away from my law, I will throw you into confusion. Has anybody in this room ever been confused about anything? Okay, I want you to go back and think for a minute how you felt when you was confused. <laughs> okay, you know you was driving in Florida trying to find this place. Let's go there for how about that one for example. <laughs> you have the address, but you keep missing the exit. And it takes you to West Palm Beach to get back. How do you feel when you're confused? You're still active. Still wasting gasoline, you are still wasting time, but you ain't getting nowhere. Confusion means you're still busy, but not effective. Confusion means you are spending money, you are using time, and wasting all of it. A confused person is a, is a dangerous person. God, it will make you confused. Now look at the last line. He says, and you will be unsuccessful in everything you do this is in the Bible God says you walk away from my fundamental foundational laws I predict your future you ain't smarter than God your PhD means nothing to God's laws you can't outgrow God's laws you can't out educate God's laws God says no matter what you try you will be unsuccessful some of you'll never see these scriptures eh? because look if you start tampering with laws that are permanent you're predicting your own failure yeah. 
You see this instrument? What is that? A compass. Write this down, please. I want to tell you why I'm showing you the compass so much. We talk about uh, uncontrolled change. Because here's the danger of change. To advance progress and develop, change is necessary. That's true. But here's the problem. Not all change is improvement. Not all change is in advancement. Not all change is development. Not all change is progressive. There are people who you knew, and perhaps still know, who were good people in your family. And now they can hardly stand up. You go to visit them, they're on the floor in a mess. They changed. But it wasn't a good change. You know your sister was not an alcoholic five years ago. You know your brother was not a dope addict ten years ago. And you go to visit them, they don't even know where the door is. There's a change. But is it a good change? Ladies and gentlemen, all true change must occur within the boundaries of natural and spiritual laws. That's the point. You cannot just decide, I want to see some changes. You cannot change by ignoring the boundaries established by God and the principles that are even natural in nature. Yes. You cannot just decide that your vote is more important than God's natural law. One thing I love about nature, it doesn't care about your vote. This is an important statement I'm making here. All true change must occur within boundaries. It must occur within some principles that are laid down. Some laws that have been pre-established. In other words, make a note of this. Change can develop or destroy. Did you know that? Anyone in this room who has a tumor or had a tumor, you just got healed, or if you know someone who had a tumor, a tumor is actually good cells. Every doctor here will tell you that a tumor, including cancer, you know cancer tumors, these are good cells. The problem is something happened in the chromosome level of the cell that called it for the cell to multiply too fast. It's a good cell. But it multiplied too fast. There was some interference in the chromosome of that cell, which codes for normal multiplication. Your cells right now are multiplying a million a minute. That's why you're still alive. But if a cell malfunctions and it begins to multiply too fast, then it becomes too many cells together and we call it a tumor. A tumor is simply a multiplication of cells that multiply too fast. So here we see. Your whole body is made up of cells. Your cells will keep you alive. Your cells are important. But too many of them at the same time can destroy you. What makes the cell a tumor? A law of control was broken. I don't think we have any idea what our country is going to look like in 10 years by some of the laws we are recommending. I am afraid for America. America is such a great country the last 200 years. But I'm so afraid that the laws that they are tampering with seem to be disturbing the chromosome of natural laws that can end up with tumors that are nationally destructive. I'm talking about global implosion. Don't ever think a tumor is a bad cell. It's a cell out of control. Some companies collapsed because they grew too fast. Some of your business people here today will tell you the company started big and, and they got excited and they moved to a building they couldn't finance. And, 
and the higher people they couldn't pay, all of a sudden they realize that this, is, this weight is too much. And then they call it resizing and downsizing. In other words, let's go backward, they say. Why? Because you didn't manage the growth. You didn't control the change. And the very thing that was supposed to be a blessing became a curse. Your company became your burden. Are we smarter than God? That's why God says, don't get pregnant until you're married. He knows that if this doesn't work out right, you can have a generation of unparented kids in gangs breaking into your homes. So he says, get married, have a kid, and you bring them up as parents. He's protecting you from a tumor. Crime is a disease created by us. Because we violated God's awesome reestablished laws from history time. Somehow we think we are smart enough to outgrow truth. We invent our own. Write this down, please. Without change, there can be no improvement. But the problem is not all change is improvement. I say it again. Don't just change for the sake of change. People sitting down now with their, their constitutions and they decide they want to update, upgrade, revise, renew, retweak. Okay, I am sure that there are areas of all things you can tweak a little bit in life. But there's some things you shouldn't touch. For example, I want you to go home and decide, I'm going to tweak the foundation in my house. Go home and just try it. <laughs> there are some things you cannot touch if you want to survive. Now you could change the windows from blinds to hurricane shutters. House still solid. You can change the doors anytime you want. House still solid. You can even change the roof. House still solid. See, there's some things you better not touch. And this is why a few days ago we had the founding fathers of our country here. We didn't want to hear from the windows. We wanted to hear from the foundations. And that's why the first question was, why did you put the preamble there? The answer was, it is the underpinnings. That's the term he used. Underpinning means foundation. It holds the whole country together. That's what they told us it is. So when you tamper with the preamble, you're tampering with the very essence of what the Bahamas is built on. You can't improve on your foundation. You know, let me tell you what I think people are tending to do. They are attempting to buy a two million dollar chandelier for the house, but move the foundation. That's how smart we are. That's, that's the problem. We, we, we think that we can get away with an expensive chandelier and still move the foundations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my fear. Write this down. You must choose to change your desire. Secondly, fools multiply when wise men don't say anything. Thirdly, evil men succeed when righteous men do nothing. Fourth, darkness rules when light is absent. Five, problems reign when solutions are ignored. Six, and this is the big one, oh, you're writing this A. Buy the CD today. You cannot stop or avoid change. You have two options when it comes to change. One, you can be a victim of change or 
an agent of change. And an agent of change is the one who initiates the change they desire. But if we don't be proactive, we will become reactive and therefore we become a victim. We will either be agents of change or victims of change. We got to decide which one we want to be in our generation. And I have decided I am going to be a agent of change. Is there anyone here on that side? The world is afraid of smart believers like you. They're afraid of you. So they say to you, stay in your lane. I ain't got no lane. The whole track belongs to my daddy. Y'all clap at me before I go home. It, it, <laughs> I cross lane anytime I see the lane going or the lane. They say things like, why don't the church stay out of oil, stay out of, of, of law, stay out of politics? Shut your mouth. I ain't staying out of nothing because all of it belongs to my father. This is my country. I have to live here. Is there anybody here who believes that too? And this is why we have to be careful. Now write this down. The only way for us to regulate and control the changes we want is we have to have, kind of have a plan. Planning is the key. And the ability to plan is God's gift to man to control the future. We can design and desire what kind of future we want. Planning is man's proactive response to inevitable change. We must not just sit back and let people plan our lives. Did you hear what I just said? Did you realize what I just said? There are people sitting in rooms with closed doors, sitting around tables, planning your life while you're praying in tongues. That ends right here. That over. I won't go in the room. I want to hear what you're saying. And I want to be able to say, not this day, brother, not that thing there. You can't plan that in my lifetime or my children's lifetime. Everyone has an agenda. The church has one too. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the real church. In other words, God has given us a responsibility to bring change in the world. Now write this down. No change is more dangerous than uncontrolled change. Unregulated change. Unwise change change and this is why we must make sure that that change is controlled my friends the most uncontrollable power on earth is change I want to give you something brand new write it down what is change change is defined as to deviate from a set of a set reference. Write it down. This one, you got to write this one down. What is change? Change is to deviate from a set reference. Secondly, change means to move away from a norm. That's change. Thirdly, change is to transition from a set state. Number four, change means to violate a set of rules. Anytime someone mentions change, they are doing this right here. They are deviating, they are transitioning, and they are violating something. So when we say, let's change some things, what we're saying is, let's move away from some set rules, or some established principles, or some reference that's already there. You cannot change unless something is already set. I want you to get this point. So change is only defined by something that is stable. <laughs> this is very important. See, he got it. Some of y'all didn't get it. You cannot say, I want change unless there's something already stable. So when we talk about changes in our society, our society, changes in our culture, changes in our future. We're talking about moving away from some things that we considered a reference, a norm, a set state, and rules we abided by. Oh, I wish I could tell you how important this is. 
So when they say, let's change the definition of marriage, the very statement implies there is a definition already. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you say that you are oriented to be a she-male, then that must mean there is a female and a male. In other words, you cannot deviate from a deviation. Write that down, man. That's good stuff. You can only deviate from something that's original. So when a person is away from the original, they are called a deviant. I think you use all kinds of terms, you know, sexual preference, you know, orientation. No, you are a deviant. You deviated from the original norm. That's all. And be honest and say that. Don't try to get me to bless it. Just tell me you are a deviant and be your friends. Are you with me? Change has to have a reference. And so we cannot declare change without admitting that there must be an original reference. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, let's get a little deeper then before we run. Change is impossible without an original reference. Therefore, the question is, what is an original reference? And this way we get it now to simplicity in God. Number one, the original source is considered an original reference. For example, if you took a bucket and put it in a well, and you pulled the bucket up with water in it, what is the source of the water in the bucket? the well. So the well is the reference. So if someone asks you where you got the water from, you refer back to the well. Now the bucket can never be a well. You're all slow today. There's some people who say, look, God made me male. I want to change myself. You can't change yourself. You ain't the well. Somebody clap by itself. You, just, you can't. The bucket will never be the well. The bucket of the keep referring back to the well. And when someone asks you, where did you come from as a bucket of water? You have to refer to the well. Keep going back to the well. And if they want water, don't tell them come to you. You got your own water. In other words, a bucket can never outgrow the well. The bucket is never better than the well. It's never bigger than the well. It's never wiser than the well. At least the point number two. What is the re original reference? Is the original state of something. Now, stake. Now, what do I mean by stake? Uh, we have a gentleman here who is a experienced uh, what you call those guys surveyor yeah is he here today are there any surveyors here yeah, stand up here Barack Warren one of our ministers now he is a surveyor I want you to get me a microphone I want you to ask him something see we think we smarter than God when you start moving the stake <laughs> you get locked up Now, we have a professional man who owns a surveying company. I'm going to ask him to tell us, what is the first thing a surveyor looks for to find out where property is and is not? Tell us how you do it, sir. Well, the first reference is the... Oh, what word did you use again? The first reference. Okay, see that now? You see where we're going again? Okay, confirmation here. Go ahead, sir. The first reference is what is established from the original design. Okay, stop there again. So as a surveyor, the first thing you look for right. is not what the pe person want. Correct. You look for what? The original, original design. Original design. Right. 
And then you look for what? The references that were established at that time. So you go back to the original design and you look for the original reference. What do you call the reference? Well, in the, it's interesting, the Old Testament, um, one of the first laws that God gave Moses was says, do not um, move the ancient boundary stone. Yeah, we can get to that voice in a minute. <laughs> see, see now, he's a, now this guy is a professional architect and he's using scripture for his company. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, the, the original design is what is set up as uh, to be the authority to keep uh, whoa, order. Whoa, 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 you sounded good words. Okay, so the original design is what? The authority. Huh. But I thought that the authority was my opinion. No? No opinions, though. No, no opinions in surveying. No. <laughs> All right. So if all of us vote on my opinion, that still don't count. No. If all of us vote that the boundary is here, that don't change the boundary? Not the original boundary. If we held a referendum and decide the boundary somewhere else, does that change the boundary? For a blind man, yes. For what? A blind man. For a blind man, it yes. changed the boundary. <laughs> Jesus, no <love laughs> other <place. laughs> So why... Is the reference, the original reference called a stake? Well, the original reference maintains order. Because oh, stop again, stop again. See, see, you want to come preach, man? This is good stuff. Original reference, what? Write that down. It maintains order. That means when you move the original reference, there's social disorder. Okay, it's an authority. What else is it? It's the authority for the system and it maintains order in society. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's an overlap, there's something called encroachment. Whoa, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> Write that way down for me, man. Okay, so now when boundaries overlap, if somebody overlap, it's called what? It's encroachment. Called encroachment. It means that uh, someone is usurping the rights. Someone is usurping. Don't walk too fast. Okay. So there are some people dressed in suits in Parliament who are claiming to re to usurp God's authority. So the Supreme Court judges can actually move the stake. That's correct. But it's not real. It's called usurping. That's right. It's called a, the, the authority of a blind guide. That's the word you use? Well, no, no. I'm saying in the scripture. Be yeah, the, the scriptures call it the blind guy. Right, yes, yes. So what do you call that in your business? Well, in, in, that, in, in surveying, uh, if there's confusion and boundaries, you have to always go back to the original reference. Say it again now. If, if there's, there's confusion, confusion in, boundaries, in the boundaries, right. you must always go, go back, back to the original to reference. The original reference. Right. You're right, down, man. That's good stuff. Okay. You watch this now, you see, now what are we doing right now in our country? Is we tampering with what? The boundaries well, are. Well, we, we're, we're creating what we, some people desire, not knowing what the foundation is. And what we do is we create confusion according to what we think is the right way to go. And what we think doesn't cancel the original? No, what we think is, is, is contrary to the creator. And so what we're trying to do is to, uh, create a superficial creation that we think is superior superficial to yes. creation. You're right, never down, man. So, so you can have an, a superficial country. Correct. So you can have a superficial marriage. That's correct. Or confusion. So you can have a superficial family. That's correct. Hmm. You can become a superficial person. That's correct. <laughs> man, this is heavy stuff, man. So next time you see somebody in the airport who ain't sure what they are, just tell them, you superficial. <laughs> you know, so let's talk for a minute about the stake. What, what is a stake in, in super surveying? A stake... A stake would be the reference that determines the, basically of a stake would be a determin, de determination between, a, 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 well, two stakes determine a boundary. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's a, a point of reference 
they determine basically two properties or two, two sets of rights in land. So the, the stake is the point of reference that gives you determination. That's correct. You can determine anything from a stake. From the stakes, yes. Okay. Once you find a stake, you can make a determination. That's correct. Okay. So a reference is the stake against which you measure all determination. Give our surveyor a hand. Thank you very much. A hand. Thank you very much. So please write down number two. Number three, an original reference is the original point. Number three, number four rather, it is the original law against which everything is measured. So a reference point, therefore, is the original principle established. When you start talking about change, you must first find the reference. Our founding fathers sat on the stage a few weeks ago, and three of them said, I don't know why they touching this thing. They don't understand it, they said, and they trying to change it. In other words, they haven't studied the state first. What was the, what was the, the original intention for laying the stake? We got opinions about things. Some of y'all sat here and you was changing that meeting, weren't you? When the man talked about, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the husband of the woman uh, cannot just become a citizen. When he explained it, it made sense. He said, he said the reference was you go with your husband. That's a stake. He was saying it wasn't male chauvinism or, or disadvantage against women. He's saying if we don't allow some order, then anybody go anywhere, anytime, kapunkal of everything. He said there was a there was a, a law around the world which says you go to the domicile of your husband. That's all it says. We ain't, you know, we're against who you marry, but before you walk the aisle, remember, you gone. That's order. Oh boy. He was bringing us back to a stake so you can understand the words written. The power of a stake. Write it down. Number six. An original reference is the original true north. A compass is useless without true north. You can buy an expensive compass for $2 million, but if there's no north, you wasted $2 million. So when you start talking about changing direction, you must first find north. Oh boy. I, I told you that you cannot define change unless there is a, an established norm. My question is, who creates north? Okay, that's an important question, I got you. Who, who created north? God, the creator established in creation an energy field in the system of the core of the earth that cause gravitational waves to pull in a certain direction and they always pull north. He put that there for two reasons. One, he gave us gravity so we don't float away. That means it holds us down and we always can know where we are. Wow! You cannot vote against gravity. You can't hold a referendum against gravity. Democracy doesn't affect gravity. If 90% of us voted against it, it'll still exist. That's the way the laws of God are. Your opinion doesn't touch it. So if it wasn't for the north, there'd be no south, no east, no west, 
no south southwest no midwest no west west southwest there'll be nothing without one north there's got to be something that doesn't move come on somebody yeah. hallelujah that's why the first thing god gave moses when he said i'm going to create a new nation he gave him law he said now don't touch it and listen to me god was so committed to order in that nation that he told Moses, if a man commits adultery with another woman, kill him. Now let me explain, let me explain this to y'all. Some of y'all say, you know, well, you know, Brother Miles, you know, the Old Testament is, you know, violent and, you know, God is a bloody God, love blood. You know, it's, no, 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 see, you missed the whole point. The point was, this law is so important. That was the point. That if you violate the law, it's better to remove you from the community because it can destabilize the entire community. That was the point. It wasn't the stoning. It was the value of fidelity. Thou should not kill, he says. Whoever kills another man, his life shall be taken. Oh, I don't believe in capital punishment. God said, look, you, you missed the point. The point has nothing to do with capital punishment. The point is the value of human life. That's why the people sitting in this building right now and watching this program, whose relative was killed, and the person who killed them is in jail, and these people still can't sleep because you see, 20 years in prison cannot to be equal to the value of the absence of a relative forever. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not it's not the punishment God was talking about. It was the devaluation of human value when you treat a life for 20 years. You can't compare life for 20 years. He was establishing a north. And most of the people who stand up in public, talk about these things, have no idea about scripture. Always quoting things they don't understand. It makes me wonder. It'd be nice. <laughs> and some of the people in parliament quoting things, man. And they don't go to church. They have no good pastor to teach them the understanding of those scriptures and they quoting against God. They don't understand the principle, the, the law, the, the stake that God was establishing. God was saying, look, thou shalt not steal. That was a stake. Don't move things that ain't yours legally. That includes other people's spouse. Some of y'all ain't clapping, boy. Look here. You better clap, brothers, because, you know, you might confuse me. <laughs> some of you women too better, you better clap women some of you all too because you all might be the other woman I rebuke you in the name of Jesus stop breaking God's laws and go home true north 